off and over here in the Massachusetts. Also, I mentioned it is to make markets for other people. Uh, if we do that, we all want to make great software platform. If we do the marketing, the blog, the social media, the web apps, anything that we want to do to do the job. And we started using platforms when we started with this platform to allow us to collaborate across the entire company, everything from our sales marketing and engineering product that we need to support to truly allow every voice in our spot to have an equal voice to build a crowdsource spot. It's really where we keep all of our information. Information is really important here at HubSpot because we believe in being very transparent and being very analytical. So, confidence is where we play the right Centralized meeting notes, board meeting notes, product meeting notes, and other bad items. We have a lot of conversations about confidence. Often we'll call the company to gauge opinion on a certain important issue. Pretty much anything that we need to do to create a better business, we do with confidence. And it's really easy to use. It's easy to have conversations. It's easy to share structured information, produce things, and it's easy to do that. Every house buyer can post their own ideas, their own metrics, and their own metrics for the company. And then as the house buyer manages those metrics, publish them to the wiki, and get peer review and basically feedback from the entire company on how well they've done. But honestly, in some cases, experiments how well they haven't done, and that's how we learn to do that. Really make sure that information flows for you and that everyone in the company is full of sense. So, for instance, a great use case in House Bob's, our CEO and co founder this weekend posted an article asking for one piece of advice that a House Bob would give to every single new House Bob. Within 72 hours over the weekend, we had over 82 comments on that article with saved advice of what we should do to make your brand House Bob better. First thing I found off most of you about the day one, um, you're never too small to collaborate with a company of two or three people. Any company of this size that's not collaborating in such a real time fashion should strongly consider using confidence that it's the best way to do it. Take that journey. I'm going to walk you through 
three different areas uh, that will help you uh, paint the picture. Firstly, we're going to talk about the principles of confidence and why we built them. The next thing is going to be about its key features and how these key features tie back to the principles of the way we built confidence. And finally, I'll finish with a, a short preview of what's coming up in our roadmap. So let's get started. So you might be asking, if you don't know about confidence, what exactly is confidence? And how we define confidence is confidence is where you create, organize, and discuss work with your team. And over 10 million people use confluence already today for that very purpose. And they use it across a number of different organizations, including these ones that you see above. And they come from a bunch of different industries and sizes. And you heard from HubSpot in the video up the, at the start. And the reason why I showed you the video is because HubSpot use confluence to communicate and collaborate every day. And they're a really good example of why we build confluence. So let's go through why we actually did build confluence. The first principle is everyone has a voice. Now remember I talked about that research around engagement. Having a voice and giving everyone a voice empowers people to be heard. So everyone, everyone having a voice is a key part of it, and we empower people to do that. The second principle is that teams have a foundation or a fabric to collaborate. And finally, what gets done. Now, our confluence is not just a social tool, it also, we, we built it in such a way that you can go through a cycle because you do a lot of work, you create a lot of things, but it's really important to actually close the loop and what has to get done. So it's really all about productivity. Now, how all of these combine and manifest in the product, firstly, for example, giving everybody a voice, it's really about giving everyone a way to create and broadcast this content into the environment, whether it's uh, their small team, or large team, or cross teams, or to the rest of their organization. The second one is discussion and refining. And this ties back to giving a foundation for collaboration. The last one is about getting work done. And so that means taking action on all of the content that you create, you discuss and refine, and then finally closing the loop, be it a meeting note or a decision or many other pieces of content, uh, content or projects that you might be involved with. And this is what we call the collaboration cycle. Now all these three combined are manifested in the product and we surface that in three different ways. Now we're going to take a deep dive into each one of these one by one. So let's actually talk about creative first. Now, confluence and the key part of it is we create many, many documents on a daily basis, as I said. You create a general, general pages to capture status, communicate status, it could be meeting notes, uh, it could be around other types of forms and documents that you need to do as part of completing the project. And it's really about providing one place for all of these documents to exist. I think the challenge with other systems is that they provide a personalized view of this rather than having a team-centered view. And confluence is where teams connect. So teams have an opportunity to contribute into confluence as well as to opt in for notifications and, and getting updates. Now, to really explain why one place is really important and how it's different to other tools, I'm going to walk you through a very common pain point that I think we all have today. How many 
people have heard this question on a daily basis? You show of hands. Do you get the question of, were you on my email? Did you get my email? Is that, a, is that a regular thing that you guys always encounter? Well, if you do, as I do, the thing is really about reducing the amount of complexity that we have to deal with in our work environment. Now let me take you through an example. Now if I were to send a simple announcement email to everybody, this is what happens. So I send the email and blast it off to my team or uh, cross teams. And the first thing that happens is I might get some replies, or maybe only one person replies, not the rest of the group. Or the opposite happens. I get blasted by everybody, and I get replies from everyone, and suddenly I have to deal with a huge reply all storm. And it's really hard to thread all of the different emails that come through. And try and sometimes people skip emails and say you don't get a, a consistent flow of that information. The other challenge is when new people start, they're not actually part of that thread. They either may get added a little bit later in the thread, or they don't get added at all. And so when somebody leaves in that group who was part of that email, they generally take that inbox with them. And so that information is lost, it's not referenceable, and new people have a big struggle to get started, and they lose that context. As I said, it's lost to future reference, and this is a very um, problematic thing in most organizations. And then the last thing is, throughout all of this, it's really hard to track engagement. Did I actually get the feedback I wanted on the thing that I sent out? Because you might, as I said, get some replies or all replies, and you end up with a spectrum of issues. Now, well, how is it work in confidence? Instead of actually sending an email, I'll either create a page or a blog, and I share that with my team, or even a broader group of people. I can easily track engagement with likes and comments, because I see who's actually commented on the page or liked it. Even a, a like is a less form of a comment, but at least you know they acknowledged it and read the, read the particular document that you sent out. The next is, people can opt in for updates. You don't have to be on that thread all the time. You can watch the page, you can favorite it, and then as soon as you do, Confluence will send you a notification whether you're inside a conference or via email about updates to that page. Because the page is not just a static thing, it's a living document. Now, new team members can also benefit from it because it's a reference. The page continues to exist after people leave the company. If there's attrition, which always happens in larger organizations, unfortunately, people come and go. And so onboarding new team members is a lot easier because you can just point them to a reference. And then finally, it's far more collaborative because it's, if you comment, the people who comment after you can see your comment and build on it. And that building process is how we refine it. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Now here's another pain point. Unfortunately, most meetings do so. But Confluence gives you an ability, using the meeting notes blueprint, to have instant structure. You can notify attendees using at mentions. So just like Twitter, where you can at mention a friend or, or a peer, you can do that also inside a page of Confluence and pull people into the conversation. We give you an outline of the agenda, so you can structure your page. You can also override this with your own template if you so wish. And finally, you have contextual tasks. Tasks that are specific to that page that you can track and assign it to an owner and even assign it to a due date. 
And that way, things eventually will get done and meetings will, will actually start being more meaningful as they move forward. So conflict meetings, they're effective, you get on the same page with your team, and hopefully you'll, they'll help you make more decisions rather than just have status updates. Now what this really means is we don't have to be very formal when we engage in meetings. We can do a lot of things offline, and so decisions don't need handshakes because you don't all have to be present to have it. So with Confluence Decisions Blueprint, you can define who, what, and when the decision needs to be made. You can add that into the page. You can also add extra content to give you more background, and you can send it off for pre-reading. So if you have to, still have to have a meeting, then you can send it as an earlier tool. People can get their head around what you're sharing and what you're asking to, to make a decision on. And you can create richer content using imagery, graphs, uh, or other macros that we allow on a particular page. So once people start adding comments to that, and they can do this asynchronously, they don't have to be present in the room. You can get to consensus and alignment a lot faster because you don't physically have to have everybody in the room. You also get a record of the decisions. Just like meeting notes, you can record the decisions. And then one of the benefits of confluence is for every decision you make, and just like most, most other blueprints, we roll up all of that into a, a collection. So if you have a whole series of decisions, you can find past decisions using the decision register, where you can get a list of all the past decisions you have. So again, you can reference it forever. So you don't have to go back and say, oh, well, why didn't we make that decision? You can reference it, or, or not go back and find the past decisions that have been made. So decisions and confidence. You can bring everyone together, not necessarily at the same time, but you can still get on the same page. You can, it's a way to get uh, reach consensus and get to that approval stage or a deciding stage. And finally, you can reference it forever. So now you've reached your first tip, which is about making meetings matter. So one thing we do with new hires at the last year is we actually dominate them into our meetings culture. And one of the things that we do is we have status pages, right? And what we tell people is if you think your meeting is going to be around communicating status, try putting it on a page instead of actually having a meeting. We have far too many offices worldwide and it's too difficult to get people together for, uh, because of time zone and geography. So, in order to grow and continue to scale the collaborative culture, we have status pages like meeting notes and decisions. And so instead of actually having that meeting, we put it on a page, and people can comment and benefit from that. The other one, is that people can synchronously access the page. You might also find that one of the things that we find is that people outside of the people who shared the original document with can comment. So sometimes you might get an expert commenting on something that you didn't expect. And it usually results in a better outcome. And then the other thing is if any questions are raised in that status page, it's also captured. The other thing we do with regards to our meetings culture is when you have a decision meeting or you know you're going to have a decision meeting, we actually ask people in a calendar invite or maybe when you share the page, is to structure the page or the invite as a question. The reason for that is when you're sharing the page or the calendar invite or a link to the page, people can start thinking about what decision needs to be made and what the options are before they get to the meeting. So this is a really uh, important way of 
of getting people ready uh, so that they can actually make a decision in the meeting. Most often, we actually do a lot of decisions unless they're really big and crucial without meetings. And finally, one of the things that I want to share is making sure you understand who your contributors versus who has to be informed. There are a lot of meetings where there's many, many people in the room, and sometimes only some of those people are actually going to be contributing to the outcome versus the number of people who just need to know what the outcome is. So shortening the number of people that need to contribute will help get the means of moving faster. So that's your first tip for today. Now, as I said, scaling the collaborative culture is, is about having even the large companies feel like small teams. So let's talk about that a little bit more. One of the things we do and we leverage is another type of page, which you're familiar with, I'm sure, which is blogs. Now, this is an example of how one of our founders, Scott, has actually introduced my new boss, in fact, Bernardo, to the company. We use blogs for just about everything. We use it to share information about you, your team, all the learnings that are happening in your team, and things that are happening maybe at the C-level or the management level across the company. Now another type of blog that we use, and I highly recommend, is welcome blogs. Now every time that we use higher stars, we ask them to write a welcome blog. And you might wonder what's the, the value of doing this? Well, it's because we, we have a lot of people starting all of the time. We're growing very rapidly, and I'm sure some of you have experienced that in your organizations. So how do you break down those barriers for those new starters, how do they feel a little bit more welcome? And the reason why we have welcome blogs is you get to know somebody before you actually meet them. And I'll show you what some of the traits of a good welcome blog for a start, just to help you get started. So here's an example from a friend Isaac, who uh, introduces himself as a good start for a welcome blog. Secondly, we recommend putting a, a picture of yourself so when you see them in the lift or in the hallway, you can say hi. Sometimes we have many people with a lot of diversity in the company, so they're from very different parts of the world, which always makes for more interesting conversations. So we say, where are you from? Then we talk about hobbies and what they're interested in. And that's always good because there's lots of meetup groups going around in last year and a lot of social activities that happen outside of work, so that's a great way to break the ice. But we don't recommend you tell your, your life story. As interesting as sometimes it may seem to you, we actually tell people to just keep it simple and share, share those things. And finally, we tell people to not post their resume or CV because that's what they do this for, and similar tools like that. So conference blogs, they really do kill information silos. If you have lots of departments in your company, information silos can really kill the learning that you can learn from each of your teams. So conference uh, blog posts really overcome that. Finally, it allows you to engage employees and new starters as well. You know, having those icebreakers, meeting new people. But finally, it also helps you reduce email. Every time, if we have to send an email to all staff every time someone starts, our inbox will be completely full. So you now you reach tip two, which is become a learning organization. When you share things through your blogs, we constantly see ourselves learning new things from our teammates. So having that collaborative culture is really about sharing and also listening to what what is happening around you. So that helps us continue to learn and grow as a company. Now, we talked about meeting notes and decisions. Let's talk, another, talk about another thing. Questions. Now, when you have a question, whether you're a new star or not, 
difficult thing is you usually start writing that email and you send it to somebody who you think may know the answer. And there's probably half, you know, half a dozen times a day this happens where people are either just starting or maybe they've been at the company for a while and it's a new problem. And email again is a pretty bad place to have that. I'll tell you why. It's because you don't retain the knowledge. Again, it's lost in an inbox. And someone takes it when they leave. So what we've introduced on top of Confluence is this add-on called Confluence Questions. Confluence Questions is a Q&A tool, a question and answer tool, that allows you to post a question, and then you get answers from your team or anyone else in the company. And each other gets to vote up what they think the best answers are. So naturally, the best answers flow to the top all the time. And the value of doing this is not only do you retain new higher knowledge, you also get to identify who your experts are in your organization. So here's a screenshot of how we slightly gamified uh, confidence questions to allow you to have a point system and, and awards, rewards. Uh, and what you start adding is a set of topics that you may become an expert on. So very quickly you start identifying experts. And then new the confidence questions in, in our latest version is you can securely ask a question. If you don't feel comfortable that the question is appropriate for the whole company, you can just restrict it to maybe your department. So this one is an example of um, sharing a question just with the finance department. We're also allowed you to now include questions in a particular space. So if you just want to have a question and answer within a space, you can do that now with the latest version. So complex questions. You ask once, but you can reference it forever. New buyers and everybody can benefit from it. You can onboard team members by pushing them to the question and answer page where all of the good answers are flowing to the top. And you can also identify. So now you reach your third tip, which is make sure you retain your tribal knowledge. Because the challenge is you may have an expert that leaves and takes all that knowledge with them. So this is a great way to retain it. Now, something that we recently launched in Confluence 5.7 is how you plan and communicate roadmaps very easily. So here's a little bit of a demo where you go in and you add a map the roadmap planning macro to a page. And you get a graphical view of how to build a software or other type of timeline plan. You can add swim lanes and lozenges for the type of project, and they're all colorized. And, color and you can also edit it all visually and graphically. You can stretch it out. It's got a timeline for months and quarters, and we'll be adding more timelines. You can add milestones as well by having markers. So if there's something that important, important that happens on that day, you can add a milestone. So for example, that one's a beta launch and a, and a general availability. So that's a demo of the roadmap plan. And one of the coolest things is when you actually roll over a particular lozenge, you can actually get a link to a page or create a link to a page. So I've just created a link now, and I've linked it to my mobile web requirements project. So if you're a software team or a product manager, you can actually build your roadmap out and have it linked to the requirements specification. So there's a, a really nice traceability story going from the actual planning tool and the roadmap right to the requirements specification. That's roadmaps. So you can create beautiful and simple roadmaps very easily. You can have your team align on, at a high level about what we're doing as a team. And you can also link to more detailed pages for more information. So now you learn about meetings, decisions, blogs, questions, and roadmaps. So the first three are what we call blueprints. They're like templates, but they're a bit more powerful than templates, and they include it in the core product.
far as the confluence. Questions and an atom that sits on top of confluence, you can purchase it separately, but it's also integrated very nicely into confluence. And finally, we have roadmaps, which is a macro which you insert into the body of the page. And that can be any type of blueprint or page that you create. So now we've just covered the first part of our collaboration cycle. This is create. Let's move on to discussion and refining. So why do we actually want to discuss and refine? And it's because we want to reach a better outcome. We always strive to get to a, and aspire to be uh, to get to a better outcome because we want to produce great work as a team. And how do you actually get that feedback from your team? So I showed you earlier, you can share something. This is the share dialogue that lives on every page in Confluence. You can add people in your organization or users within your system. So these are three people that I work with every day, and I've sent them a quick note. And when I hit share, they'll get notified either in product or via email, whatever they wish. They can even where you're adding capabilities so you get notified in hip chat and other places as well. Now, in addition to shares, we have this thing called mentions. Because sometimes you may actually share a page, but then subsequently when you want to comment on something and bring someone else into the conversation, you can just say, hey, I think someone should look at this, and then you can type at the at symbol, and then type in my name or someone else's name, and pull them into the conversation. Because what will happen is as soon as you do that, and save that comment or, or anything like that, that person will actually get a notification about that mention, and they'll get a reference to the page, and then they can click on it and get to the page, and then put their answer or feedback down as well. So it's a great way to collaborate and bring more collaborators into the conversation as needed. Now, how do you get feedback at a company level? And that's a bit more challenging. At a team level, you know, you can walk over and talk to your team or you can do those things you said. Getting feedback from a company, especially when you have a large company, is a much bigger challenge. So what happened here is, again, our CEOs wanted to engage our entire company to ask them what we should do in the next two years at a massive, what we call our penny virtual. So by 2016, what would we do? And he asked a question on conference questions. He gave a couple of examples of what he thinks we could be doing. And he just left it at that. He put a link to another page for more reference if they needed to read. And guess what happened? We had over 250 different people respond to that across the company. And we had over a thousand people vote on those 250 responses. So we got the entire company engaged in something that someone at the highest level of our company was asking. Now that's what I really call engagement at all levels. So that's why we've reached our fourth tip, which is around engagement starts with listening. So in order to actually engage people, it's not just about broadcasting your, what you want to share, it's also about listening and getting that feedback because we want to get to a better outcome. Now, something that we've introduced, and I think Jay covered this earlier, is we've introduced a new feedback loop in Confluence in 5.7. I'll cover that briefly because Jay also covered it earlier. In 5.7, we've introduced inline comments in addition to page level comments. So as you can see here, I can highlight a piece of text so that is your team getting to be done as a title is being highlighted in yellow. And Ken has left an inline comment on a page. And in addition to leaving the comment, 
He's left an app mention for Sven, who also get a notification to be pulled into the conversation because Sven has the answer. And this is a screenshot of Sven in the process of writing his response. So he's responding to potentially alternative titles for this. So now you have inline comments in addition to page level comments. Let me actually walk you through very briefly what they look like. So what you saw from Jay earlier is you can have a series of different comments on a page which are inline, and those are the ones that are highlighted. You can have six to, to a multiple comments on a particular piece of text. And we scroll down to the bottom, you can actually see page level comments as well. So if you don't want to make a comment about a particular piece of context on a page or content, you can do it at a page level. So you still have likes and you still have page comments to do as well. So that's in my comments. They're contextual. They're very collaborative because you can use app mentions and as well as shares. And it's really about being productive because you can also resolve them. And I'll show you that when we get to the, the last part of our collaboration cycle. Now, in addition to text-based inline comments, we wanted to bring that same power, that same capabilities that we can have on pages to something you work with every day, which is files. You work with many, many files in your daily life, and we acknowledge that. Not everything can be done on a page. But we wanted to give you the same power inside the conference so you can have the conversation and have all of that collaborative fabric and foundation that we offer for discussion and refinement inside the conference. So as Jay showed you earlier, this is actually a real page on our internet. And this is a presentation for our road trip that we were about to do. And when you click into that thumb, that embedded thumbnail, you get a rich preview of the page. It's a beautiful preview that gives you a high fidelity render of the content, whatever it is. We support multiple file types. And this particular one is a presentation. Now, as I said earlier, we wanted to bring the same power of page level inline comments to files, and you can do that. So you can actually drag a pin and annotate a piece of te uh, text or an area of the file. And you can drop that in and add your comment in the same way. So file, that's file collaboration. It's beautiful, it's simple to use. We offer the same versioning capability that you can have with pages. And it's also productive because you can also resolve. So that's discussion and refinement. Now we're getting to the last part of our collaboration cycle, which is about actually getting the work done. So create was about, remember, giving the organization a voice and giving everyone a voice. Discussion was around using that collaboration fabric. And acting is really about that getting work done principle that we feel confidence for. Let's take a look. Now I'm going to show you this. So I'm going to show you the tip first because it's a setup for everything else. Now, why we actually want to get the work done is not to create or work in the process of getting work done, but we give you a methodology and a way to speed up how you can close the loop. And that's really to apply it. So all of the examples I provided earlier about doing things more offline or asynchronously is really about moving faster as a team and then as a result, as an organization, we can allow more people to stay in the flow and be more productive. So I showed you tasks, which can be added to meeting notes or any other parts of the page and they can be you know, contextual and assign to people. Show you about decisions, questions, 
how easy it is to ask questions and retain that knowledge. And then finally, I showed you comments, which is actually new. So let's have a look specifically at comments and how we close the loop on comments. So let's close the loop on page flow discussions. So remember this during the discussion and refinement when we created the page. So now we actually have Sven's comments. And Ken is satisfied with it. So what does he do? He can go and click resolve. And the comment is resolved. And we've got what we've done. Because he's modified the page and made it better. Now, how do we actually do the same thing on top of discussions? Exactly the same way. Now, instead, because you're working with a file, instead of actually just clicking resolve and modifying the page before you do that, you have to actually make the changes offline in your editor of choice, be it Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or other Office tools, and then upload a new version. So what you can see here is we've uploaded a new version. We've actually added a change log for what has changed, so people can understand what's changed between the files. And we can get to a resolution as well. So that's getting work done inside Confluence with these four capabilities. So now you've actually graduated from the whole collaboration cycle. So let's, before we go on, let's recap some of the things that we've learned. So here are all the tips in one slide. It's about making meetings better, making meetings matter, becoming a learning organization, retaining a tribal knowledge to your questions, listening first, and engaging an audience to improve your feedback loop, and finally, using confluence and its other capabilities to actually close the loop. So whether it's finishing a task, making a decision, or resolving a comment, these are all ways for you to close the loop. And you can do this all offline, very synchronously, without having meetings about everything. So now that we've uh, come to the end of that part, I can show you uh, some of the things that we're working on in the future. So if you've got a large instance of Confluence, you have a lot of users using it, you have a lot of pages, in Confluence 5.6 version, we introduced Confluence Data Center. And we wanted to solve three problems. We wanted to solve high availability to give you a clustered environment. We wanted to provide instant scalability so you can add nodes as you go and as your load increases. And unlike Confluence Server, it provides highest performance at peak load. And this is a critical part of how, how we work. As you can see, similar to Jason's chart, Confluence Data Center, the capabilities of how many operations it can handle as you increase the number of nodes is a natural proportion to the number of nodes you have. So as your clients increase, the number of nodes increase, and you can take on a whole load. So that's Confluence Data Center. So today, what we have is Confluence Data Center, Confluence Questions, and all of the value that I showed you earlier in the base Confluence product. And soon, we're going to have table improvements. We'll also have the following. <coughs> An improved presentation mode for the file. So I showed you that beautiful preview earlier. But sometimes, you might have a lot of annotations on it, and uh, the sidebar for inline comments. And maybe you just want to actually present that to some stakeholders. So we're going to offer a presentation mode or allow you to do that. 
Secondly, we're going to keep improving what we've done so far in online comments. And then we're going to actually improve how you do permissions in, and sharing and make that more intuitive and usable for our users. So that's coming up soon. Now coming up a little bit later, you're going to see some major performance improvements, page load improvement times. You're going to see some changes to the dashboard to make it easier for you to access and find things. We're going to introduce a better editing experience. More stability and robustness with our editor, which is the heart of where you create content. Finally, we're going to have some mobile improvements. And this one will make sure